Japan and South Korea may be neighbors, but their relationship has never been neighborly. The fight to host the 2002 World Cup would prove to be a continuation of this hostile relationship. Both countries suffered the indignities of war in the last century, only to grow and prosper with admirable speed and tenacity. Japan turned the humiliation of its Second World War defeat into decades of rebuilding and self-sacrifice. They were even awarded the 1964 Olympics. In many ways, the Tokyo Games of 1964 marked Japan's acceptance back into the civilized world. The country went out of its way to show off its modern side, with new highways, subways and railways, and with the unspoken proviso of, don't mention the war. Even now, Japan does its best to avoid mentioning war, or to be more accurate, any war that it lost and it certainly wasn't going to let its history tarnish the Olympics. Of course, countries don't always divorce sport from politics. When Seoul was awarded the 1988 Olympics, it was cause for national celebration in South Korea. The added bonus was getting it at the expense of Japan's third largest city, Nagoya. Don't forget the war might have been Seoul's motto. The simple truth is that the co-hosting of the World Cup was never going to eradicate the bitterness between the two countries. While the West might like to see Japan and South Korea as two strong economies in Asia contributing to the world's piggy bank, the relations between them are still embedded in the hate of the past. At different times in history, both Japan and Korea closed their borders to try and keep out troublesome neighbors and the evil influence of foreigners. Japan was jolted awake from its hibernation by American Matthew C. Perry's fleet of black ships in 1853. Japan finally saw what was going on in the rest of the world and realized it had some catching up to do. The first thing it did was to address the imbalance of military power. By the end of the 19th century, Japan had taken on and beaten China and Russia in regional conflicts and had Korea under its thumb. Japan formally annexed Korea in 1910 and embarked on a ruthless campaign of assimilation. Over nearly half a century, Koreans were forced to speak Japanese, adopt Japanese names, and worship Japanese gods. Many Koreans were killed. Others were taken to Japan as slave labor or to war zones as sex slaves. Koreans do not forgive easily, and this historical wound festers to this day. Japanese pro forma apologies do little to placate the Koreans. Take a tour around the South Korean capital, Seoul, and you will come across signs saying, this is the site of an ancient palace that the Japanese destroyed. At one stage, Chung Mon Jun, the pugnacious head of the Korean Football Association, even implied that Japan shouldn't get any part of the 2002 World Cup because of its brutal colonial record and war crimes. But while Japan's behavior before its defeat in World War II was reprehensible, Korea's post-war history was almost as bad. The North was repressed under Kim Il-sung, while the South was led by murderous anti-communist Sing Man Ri. Korea was a basket case after the Korean War, and only started to develop when Army General Park Chung-hee took over in a coup in 1961. However, Park's determination to develop South Korea involved intimidation, torture, and murder. Park's uncompromising military rule gave South Korea some stability and a firm hand with which to guide the war-ravaged economy, but it left the people subjugated. Eventually, they started to protest, and in 1980, in Gwangju, the army, under another military monster, Chundu Wan, answered these protests with bullets and death. As with Tokyo in 1964, a Summer Olympics heralded a new dawn in South Korea. Democracy returned to the country in 1987, and it successfully hosted the 1988 Games. Both countries boomed in the 1990s and enjoyed new freedoms. Both felt they deserved to be the sole host of the 2002 World Cup. FIFA was largely ignorant of the hate and distrust felt by the two countries, but when South Korea decided it also wanted to host the World Cup, 
FIFA soon learned the extent of this animosity. The intensity of the two countries' campaigns to secure the 2002 World Cup left no one in any doubt as to how the countries felt about each other. Indeed, some believe that South Korea's entry into the fray was little more than a thinly disguised gesture to spite Japan. No way was South Korea going to sit by and let Japan help itself to a whopping portion of sporting glory, and a free entry into the World Cup, for which it had yet to qualify. It was a natural consequence of us putting a bid in, Japan Football Association Vice President, Politician, and Mexico Olympic hero Kunishige Kamamoto stated. If we were going to do it, it's obvious the Koreans would want to get involved. South Korea was convinced that it had a better claim to host the event. Apart from its success in qualifying for the World Cup four times, it also had a professional football league that was formed ten years before the J-League. However, by the time FIFA's executive committee met in May 1996 to decide on who would get the World Cup, Japan had enough merits of its own to counter South Korea. The J-League was launched in a blaze of publicity in Tokyo in May 1993 and had stirred up more interest in Asian football than anything since North Korea beat Italy in the 1966 World Cup. Eleven members of the Brazilian squad that won the 1994 World Cup in Los Angeles ended up in the J-League. The K-League, by comparison, attracted miserable crowds, played on lumpy pitches in 4th Division stadiums, and nobody had even heard of its foreign players. Both countries remained convinced they deserved to host the World Cup. Japan certainly set the early pace, which was hardly surprising, as it already had FIFA President Havalangi and his sidekick Sepp Blatter on board. It also roped in big names such as Franz Beckenbauer and Bobby Charlton to say what a wonderful host Japan could be. This was the public face of the campaigns. The real work was done by a travelling horde of officials, politicians and spin doctors. We knew we had to make a big impression on FIFA, and we knew the way we approached things would be critical, especially when FIFA people visited Japan. Kamamoto said. But also we had to make an impression outside of Japan. For all this, we needed lots of money. At any FIFA gathering in the world, representatives from Japan and South Korea would fly in, set up shop, and start whining and dining the men of power and influence. Anyone who wanted to get an inside look at preparations in the two countries would be whisked across the world, chauffeured around, and showered with gifts. In fact, the campaigns became so frenzied that the head of the Asian Football Confederation wrote to both countries telling them to cool things down. It is our duty to take control of the situation so that the sanctity and morality of football are protected, the AFC's Sultan Ahmed Shah wrote. We are concerned with the unprecedented rivalry between the two in their campaigns to become host. The AFC is embarrassed with the intensive campaigns in every continent at all official events. In fact, the campaigns have gone beyond the limits of normalcy. Kamamoto hinted that the Koreans were going out of their way to uh, influence FIFA officials. Later, when asked if he thought the Koreans were up to no good, he replied, That's a very delicate question, and I can't answer that and then he decided he could answer that. He said, I did hear there were things going on, there were gifts of money and so on. You've seen what happened with the IOC and the Olympics, and in the end you can't say that these things never happened. Laughably, he said Japan couldn't afford to be so extravagant, saying, For Japan, finances were tight anyway, and all we could do was to rely on past alliances and to treat everybody decently. While no South Korean official would directly accuse Japan of irregularities, a Japanese foreign ministry official told the Japan Times that if Korea lost the bidding war, he expected South Korea to make allegations about Japan buying votes from FIFA members using official development assistance to influence FIFA board members from Africa. Rumors were rife that envelopes of money changed hands, lavish gifts were given, and expensive trips to the host countries were generously arranged for senior FIFA executives and their wives. 
In the end, some FIFA officials grew tired of being bombarded with information and perhaps even the food, wine and gifts. Reports suggested that each country had spent nearly $100 million on their campaigns, an amount that would ultimately prove futile. This World Cup campaign would be settled by political infighting behind closed doors.